Back in March of 2020, a colleague and I were debating whether a new strain of coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2 would have a measurable impact on U.S. mortality. The media hype was building, and he thought this was going to be major. I was skeptical. To prove the alarmist stories wrong, I began downloading and analyzing daily COVID-19 deaths on my laptop. Well, turned out I was wrong. A story without data is a myth, but data without a story are just a bunch of numbers. I'm an epidemiologist. Getting to the stories behind the data is what attracted me to this field. Building on that academic debate with my colleague, I paired up with a team of researchers and students at Emory University to track how social factors impact COVID-19 across U.S. communities. Together, we built the COVID-19 Health Equity Dashboard. It's an interactive data visualization tool available to anyone. The data we track paint a very troubling picture of the U.S. pandemic and our response. As Americans, we are disproportionately dying of COVID-19. Only one in 25 persons on this planet is an American, yet we account for one in five of all COVID-19 deaths globally. How are we letting this happen in the richest, most technologically advanced country in the world? I believe some of the answer lies in a tale of two counties. County A is a suburb and County B is a neighboring city in the Midwest. Both have similar age and sex breakdowns, and in the past year, both counties recorded similar numbers of COVID-19 cases per capita. But County B has a death rate from COVID-19 that is three times as high as the death rate in County A. Hearing that, you might be surprised and even question the data a little. What if I tell you that County B has a riskier transmission environment, a more medically vulnerable population, a more strained healthcare system? And now what if I tell you that County B has a larger share of African Americans? And it is in this group that per capita cases was highest. Are you still surprised? This is not just the story of Washtenaw and Wayne County in Michigan, where I was born. This is a storyline playing out all across the United States. We all heard media reports of emergency rooms and ICUs filled with black and Hispanic patients. At first, these reports confused me. COVID-19 is caused by a novel pathogen, and therefore nobody should have immunity. Yet the picture in hospitals and later the statistics we tracked suggested who was experiencing a severe, a severe outcome was not random. So then, what are the factors that lead to a severe outcome for COVID-19 in the United States? Factor one, it starts with coming into contact with the virus. People working jobs in nursing homes, home health care, factories and grocery stores where there is no option for remote work are more likely to be exposed to this virus. Black and Hispanic Americans make up a large share of adults working in those jobs. And when the economy reopened last summer, we saw cases rise in these groups in many states. Factor two. Once infected, several underlying medical conditions can affect one's chances of being hospitalized or dying from COVID-19. Conditions like obesity and diabetes, the conditions I studied prior to the pandemic, proved to be particularly deadly. Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans are more likely to have several of these conditions. And as an aside, it's not our genetics that really matter for disparities in these conditions. The research shows that it's social factors like income, education, and access to healthy foods that play a larger role. And that brings me to factor three. Once someone experiences severe symptoms from COVID-19, that person needs treatments that only hospitals can provide. In a pandemic, access to timely and high-quality health care is a life-and-death issue. 
Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans are less likely to be insured. And even when insured, they're more likely to live in areas with low quality health care. These three contributors to fatal COVID-19 outcomes cluster in communities of color, making some Americans vulnerable multiple times over. An effective pandemic response means that we acknowledge this as we allocate health resources. It means that we allocate these resources equitably. Now, equity is a term you're probably hearing a lot these days, and I get asked about the difference between equity and equality. On the left-hand side, we have an equal allocation system. In this system, everyone gets the same crate regardless of where one stands. You can see why that's problematic. On the right-hand side, we have an equitable allocation system. Everyone gets the crate needed to achieve the goal. Equity is often discussed as a concept grounded in fairness, and that's important. But equity is not just about fairness. In a pandemic, equity is about effectiveness. Let's take the US COVID-19 vaccine campaign, for example. As a nation, our first priority was to protect Americans working in high-risk occupations and protect Americans vulnerable to severe disease. A public health re response that's successful would be proportionate to these needs. And by either measure, virus exposure or disease vulnerability, we would expect communities of color to be prioritized. Yet, three months into the vaccination campaign, black and Hispanic Americans are lagging behind. We hear a lot about vaccine hesitancy in communities of color, and certainly that's a contributing factor. But vaccine hesitancy alone can account for this disparity. So beyond motivation to get vaccinated, let's talk about what it takes to get your shot in America. You need internet access or a lot of time to wait on the phone to fill out complex forms and navigate a fragmented appointment system. Black and Hispanic households are less likely to have high-speed internet. You need to be able to get to a vaccination center. In most of America, that means owning a car or knowing someone who does. Black and Hispanic households are less likely to own a vehicle. And in the South, they typically have farther to travel to get to one of these sites. And you need time off of work, not just to get to the center, but sometimes wait for hours in line once there. Thinking back to the types of jobs that many Black and Hispanic Americans have, time off of work is at the discretion of the employer and not the employee. It can also come with a financial hit. The emergent picture is one of multiple intersecting systemic barriers that predate the pandemic. It's about a history of social and economic exclusion that has impacted the access to life-saving infrastructure, especially among Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans. But what happened in some communities of color early in the pandemic was a warning sign for the entire nation. Since last August, cases and deaths have been rising in rural America. Many of these communities, which are predominantly white, also experience high poverty, a digital divide, and limited healthcare services. What I've described for you is not a myth in which we are powerless. This story is backed by data that show us where we're falling short. Beating this pandemic means that we don't blindly use a one-size-fits-all approach and just hope that it will work. Beating this pandemic means that we use the data to guide us on how we best leverage our vast technological and financial resources to head on address the barriers we've been talking about. That's equity. Now, some of you might be thinking that the only kind of equity that directly affects you is the type that involves your line of credit. I'm going to ask you to think again, because equity is not just about helping the disadvantaged. If the virus continues at high levels of circulation, we all have greater chance of coming into a contact with a new variant that threatens our past progress.
We all face the possibility of intermittent economic shutdowns and travel restrictions. If hospitals run out of beds or ventilators because of stretched healthcare capacity, that might affect your chances of survival should you ever have the misfortune of needing these services. So why then do we leave equity to the social justice warriors? Why isn't equity everybody's business? Where we go from here is in all of our hands. It's on all of us to drive conversations on how and whether we weave equity into a rethink of our health policies, our economy, our schools, and our communities at large. I call upon the TEDx community to seize this critical moment in America's history and imagine a new narrative for America, an America with no fence, an America in which all of us can thrive no matter where we live. Thank you.